Let's pray. Father, we come once more before your throne, asking that you would meet us as we study your word. Lord, as you always do, we know that your word never returns void, but you always accomplish through the preaching of your word, the reading and the study of your word, you always accomplish your purpose. And so we pray that your purpose would, in fact, be accomplished this morning, that we would be challenged to be people of faith as we look at the danger of unbelief. And Father, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I invite you to turn with me again to the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark. This morning we begin our study of chapter 6, which puts us over a third of the way through the Gospel of Mark, which is exciting. Some of you are thinking, are we ever going to get through the Gospel of Mark? Not really. I I trust, and the report is, I I hope this is true of all of you, that this has been as much of a blessing for you as it has been for me. Personally, I've never done a study that has been more exhilarating than this study of the Gospel of Mark. Just something about it. Week after week, being in uh, the Gospels, seeing our Lord in action, seeing Him interact with sinners, seeing Him interact with self-righteous Pharisees, seeing him in action is just amazing. And it's been a delight really to sort of join the crowds as they look in awe at Jesus. And so far, really, that's the consistent way that it's been. Jesus acting, teaching, doing some miracle, and the crowds respond with marvel or amazement. And there are a few words that convey that reality throughout the Gospel of Mark. But the idea is marveling, amazement, wonder. But this morning, we see the roles sort of reversed, where it's no longer the crowds who are amazed at Jesus. It's Jesus who, for the first time in the Gospel of Mark, is amazed at the crowd. And really, there are only two places in all of the Gospels where we see Jesus' marvel or amazement. One of them is in Matthew 8, where Jesus sees the faith of the centurion, and he marvels at it. The second one, of course, is here in Mark 6, in verse 6, where Jesus looks at the unbelief found in his own hometown. And it causes him to stand in amazement. So we could say then, in light of those two passages, Matthew 8 and Mark 6, we could say that there are two things that amaze our Lord. Two things. Faith and unbelief. Both are a marvel to Jesus. True, genuine, sincere, childlike faith, as we saw last week in chapter 5, That type of faith, the type of faith exercised by the nameless woman and by Jairus, these are the things that provoke him to wonder. It pleases him to see people exercise faith. And the same thing is true today. The Lord marvels when he sees you exercise faith in the the face of extreme difficulties. He marvels when he sees you trust him in the midst of trials. It's a delight to him. Hebrews 11.6. It's a delight to God when you take him at his word and trust his promises. When your circumstances are saying the opposite. That is the thing that is a marvel to Jesus. But, as we see in our text this morning, it's going to be the focus of our morning, is this. Not only is Jesus amazed at faith, but he's equally amazed at unbelief, especially when that unbelief comes from a people who should know better. The people we see in our passage have every reason to believe Jesus, yet they respond to him in unbelief. And so if our faith, sort of mapping on to the 21st century, if our faith, like the faith of the first century Christians, can amaze Jesus, so can our unbelief. If your faith can leave Jesus 
amazed, astounded, marveling, pleased, your unbelief can leave him equally astounded. And you know what it does to you? It leaves Jesus astounded and it leaves you crippled, spiritually hobbling around on your own wisdom, barely making it through life. And you know that, don't you? Right. When you're full of faith, the Lord is pleased, and you are joyful and virtually invincible. Right? There's no way you can fail. You understand that God is on His throne. You understand Isaiah 40. You know, why would you question Him? You understand that He's sovereign and good and wise, and you are happy. Why are you happy? Because He's your God, and He's pledged Himself to take care of you through Christ. He said, I will be your shepherd. When you live in faith, believing that, you are happy. doesn't mean you don't have trouble, but you can have joy in the midst of your trouble because you know your God is on the throne. But to live with unbelief, that's to leave us sort of hobbling around, crippled, robbed of our joy, robbed of blessing, and it leaves Jesus astounded. And so the question our text answers for us this morning is this. What is it about unbelief that is so astounding to our Lord? We know that it amazes Him, but why? What is it about unbelief that is so striking, so amazing to Jesus? Well, I see at least five reasons in our text. Now, we could go on and on with more and more, but I think there are at least five reasons that the text suggests that faith is a marvel, or unbelief, rather, is a marvel to Jesus. And what I want to do this morning is just walk through those one by one, all right? So why don't you stand with me, and we'll read our text together, and we'll see the marvel of unbelief. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Verse 6. And he wondered at their unbelief. You can be seated. A couple of things that jump out at you in this passage. One, he could do no miracle there. That's amazing. What does that mean? We'll look at that. But the key feature of the passage really is verse 6. And he wondered or marveled at their unbelief. And the word wonder there is the word thalmazo. It means to be extraordinarily impressed or disturbed. And to be shocked or surprised by something that sort of leaves you in a state of amazement. And that's where Jesus is left here. A state of amazement at their unbelief. And there are five reasons, I think, that it's so amazing to him. And the first reason we see is in verse 1. And really, it, it, it's in verse 1, but it's all the way through the passage. So we're going to, it might feel like I'm repeating myself as we move along, but you'll see that this is the emphasis really of this passage, and it's this. Unbelief is amazing because it resides in the most unexpected places. Unbelief is amazing to Jesus here because it is found, it resides, it's located in the most unexpected places. And this is the sort of theme reiterated. Look at verse 1. And Jesus went out from there, which from there is Jairus' home, which we saw in chapter 5. And he goes out from there, and he came into his hometown. 
Now, Mark doesn't give us the name of his hometown, but we know from Matthew 2 and other passages that while Jesus was very young, his family settled in the small town of Nazareth, which was about 25 miles southwest of Capernaum. Archaeologists estimate that at this point in Nazareth's history, that it would have covered only about 60 acres in all. And it would have been the place of residence for about 500 people. So we're talking about a very small town. I wonder how many of you are from a small town like that. Well, this is a very small town. And you're going you're gonna to hear, <laughs> as we work through this, very familiar things. I'm from a small town. And as I was reading this, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. I get that. My hometown was about 800 people. Jesus' was 500. So I was a little more of a metropolis than him. <laughs> but here we are in Nazareth, small, obscure town, sort of carved out on the rocky hillsides of Galilee. And Jesus would have spent about 30 years, 28 years of his life with these 500 or so people. So you can imagine that the people of Nazareth would have known him very well, partially because there's just nowhere to hide. And where are you going to go? Everyone knows who you are. Everyone knows your family. There's nowhere to go. And now, just thinking back about what it would have been like for these people to have seen Jesus grow up in front of them. We don't know much about Jesus' childhood. We know that he was sinless. Now, that enough in itself is probably enough to make him stand out, right? I mean, just think, um, no offense to any of you delightful children in here, but there are none of them who are perfect. If there was one, they would probably sort of emerge and be the you know, oddball that we all can recognize. But none of us are perfect, and, and here they are in Nazareth, and Jesus is growing up as a perfect child in front of them. Now, we also know that Jesus was extraordinary in his wisdom and understanding. At the age of 12, remember the story where he goes into the temple and is there with the rabbis and the teachers and the scribes, and we're told that he amazed them by his understanding and his wisdom. He's a 12-year-old, amazing the PhDs. So this is a kid that would have just stood out. Everyone would have known who Jesus was. And for three decades, they were able to witness his perfect life unfold. So you would expect that if anyone is going to receive Jesus, it would be the people from his hometown. The people who were able to see his life perfectly back up his message. That's powerful, isn't it? But that is just the opposite of what we find here. In a place where you would expect faith to reign, unbelief dominates. And verse 3 says that these folks who knew Jesus so well, saw Him grow up, had every reason to trust Him, they are the ones who took offense at Him. And we'll talk more about that word in just a minute, but here's the simple principle I want to point out, number one, about unbelief. Familiarity does not equal faith. Unbelief is marked often by familiarity. And the danger is that you can be so familiar with the truth, the Word of God, that you can think and be deceived into thinking that you have real faith. Knowledge, familiarity, does not equate to faith. And very often, It's the people who know the most, who are the most blessed, the most privileged with accurate information. These are the people who, surprisingly enough, are marked by unbelief. Let me just take this a bit further. These were the people in the first century who knew Jesus the best. Let's fast forward to the 21st century. Let me ask you a question. Pop quiz. Who are the people today who know Jesus the best? I hope you would say it's us. Right? Evangelical Christians? Bible-believing 
Christians, people who understand that the Bible is the only rule for faith and practice, people like you and me. We are the people who, in the 21st century, know Jesus best. So let me ask you, is unbelief present among us? Let me ask a little more pointed. What about in your heart? Is unbelief present there? It's one of the most shocking things in the world that we can know, you and I, can know so much about Jesus and assent to so much truth, yet we still find often unbelief lurking in the recesses of our own heart. Isn't it amazing? It's shocking, it's fearful, it's saddening, it's amazing, it's astounding. How can we, who know so much about Jesus, who love Him and try and are seeking to live for Him, how can we, of all people, still be marked, on occasion, I'm not talking about all the time, but still be marked by unbelief in certain situations? It's it's staggering. And you know, we actually see this throughout the Gospel of Mark over and over again. Mark is uh, probably the hardest on the disciples of any of the other Gospel writers. He doesn't soften any blows. He is hard on the disciples. And he presents them in such a way that you look at them and you say, yeah, they're not the heroes here. (laughs) These guys are not the heroes. There's only one hero here, and that's Jesus. And I need to follow him. I don't need to follow Peter, James, or John. I need to follow Jesus. And that's what you sort of come away with in Mark. And what you see in Mark is that Jesus is constantly having to confront his own disciples for their unbelief. They were the ones witnessing his power, his miracles, hearing him teach. Yet they were still often plagued with unbelief. And it's really shocking that unbelief can be found in such close proximity to Jesus. And it's a reminder for us, it's a warning really for all of us, that just because we know Jesus, just because we know his word as Christians, that doesn't mean that we can end our fight against unbelief because it's lurking in your heart and mine and we are to be constantly diligent in our fight against it. So let me ask you, you may know a lot about Jesus, but are you trusting him today? Are you trusting him with your finances? Are you trusting him with your marriage? Are you trusting him with your children? It's amazing. You can know so much about the man and still fail to follow and trust him. So you need to think. I challenge you to think, where am I not believing God today? What part of my life? Am I not fully resigned to his care? Where am I fearful? Where am I anxious? Where am I worried? These are marks, indicators of unbelief. You want to know where unbelief is hiding? Well, it's hiding in those places where you're fearful, anxious, worried. And that's where you're not believing the Lord. And it's on all of us as Christians to be hunting down unbelief and crucifying it. And we should, I think, as Christians, we should be as amazed at the unbelief we see in our own hearts as the Lord was amazed at the unbelief in Nazareth. I mean, we, it should be even more amazing, really. We, of all people, have seen, experienced, understand the gospel of Christ. And yet, we can still be marked by unbelief. So anyway, that's the first reason that unbelief is such a marvel to our Lord. Because it's found in places where you would never expect it. It's, it's a marvel because it exists even in our own hearts. It's found among people who have the most knowledge and who should know better. It's amazing. There's a second reason that unbelief is so astounding. And that's because it has the capacity or the ability to appreciate sound teaching. Unbelief can appreciate sound teaching. Look at verse 2. When the Sabbath came, he, Jesus, began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were what? Now, are these people believing or unbelieving? They're unbelieving. And they're not trusting Christ. 
But here they are, they hear the word, they hear Jesus teach, and they're left astounded. Now, Jewish custom allowed any qualified male to speak in the synagogue, but only at the invitation of the synagogue leader. So here, Jesus had to be granted permission to stand and teach, which suggests some sort of goodwill from the people of Nazareth. And maybe they're just, you know, let's just fill him out again. This is the second time to be in Nazareth. The first time they didn't believe. The second time they don't believe. So maybe this is them trying to say, well, let's give him another shot. Let's see how he does it. We don't know. All we know is that he stands up and teaches. And the response in Nazareth is the exact same response of the people in Mark 1 in Capernaum. The people who hear him are astonished. It's the same language. Literally, literally, they're filled with amazement to the point of being overwhelmed. And the reason, really, that you see the response in Capernaum and the response in Nazareth, the same response, is because everyone is in awe at what they're seeing in Jesus. They've never seen someone teach the way that Jesus had taught. They were used to, every week they come to synagogue, they were used to a scribe or a rabbi getting up and prattling on about the minutia of the law and man-made traditions, about things which were like utterly irrelevant to their lives. And here, Jesus stands up and teaches the Word with absolute authority, with a power that they had never seen before, and it leaves them in awe. Now, we're not told here whether their awe is the awe of faith or the awe of unbelief. It's kind of a it's left neutral. And we know in context that they are not believing him. And we can sort of trace out their unbelief. It leads them here, though, to ask a few questions. Middle of verse 2. They're impressed. They're astonished at Jesus. They think this is, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's very impressive. And then they ask a series of rhetorical questions. Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? So they're clearly impressed. They're just trying to figure out, now what is that? What is this that I see here? They ask three questions. Where did he get these things? And that refers to his teaching content. Where did he get these things? They're essentially asking what rabbi taught him these things? We know he he wasn't being taught that here, uh, we're not sure where this came from. So where did he get this? And then the second one, what is this wisdom given to him? Clearly, they see that he's endowed with a wisdom that is superior to anything they've encountered. And then they ask third, how are such miracles as these performed by his hands? In other words, where did he get this kind of power? So clearly, they're impressed but their unbelief actually is going to lead them to miss the most obvious answer to their questions. It's obvious that Jesus is doing what he is doing because he is, in fact, the Messiah. His life is authenticating his message. But that is not the conclusion that the people of Nazareth draw. They're impressed with his teaching abilities, but they stop short of believing him. And that's another element here of why unbelief, I think, is so astounding. Because you can lack faith and still be impressed with Jesus and His Word. Did you know that? You can lack faith and still be impressed with Jesus and His Word. One of the things that struck me as I made my way through seminary was that some of the greatest biblical scholars in the world are the people who know the most about the Bible. They write commentaries, lexicons, etc. Yet they're not saved. They're unbelievers. Many of them are professing atheists. They just understand that the Bible is an extraordinary book and that it's appealing to them to study and try to figure it out. They recognize the profundity of Scripture. They love the study of theology, but they have no faith. And I have seen that in professing Christians. I'm getting a little closer to home here. 
There is a way that you can be impressed with Reformed theology, with Bible exposition, the best of the best, Bible exposition. I'm not saying that that's what you're getting here, but I'm just saying. Uh, there's a way that you can be impressed with the best Bible teachers, the best uh, expressions of Reformed theology, that you know Burkhoff, you know the greatest Reformed writers, you know all the best theologies out there. There's a way that you can know all of that and even be attracted and, and drawn to all of that and still be an unbeliever. J.I. Packer said it best when he said, there's a way that you can love studying about God more than you love God. And that's a danger for us. It's a danger for us. You can come to church week in, week out, enjoy preaching, enjoy teaching, take notes, talk about it, but come short of loving and trusting and believing God. Now, that's amazing. That's amazing. It's astounding. And it's deadly. Because loving the Bible and loving Reformed soteriology does not make you a Christian. But the deception is, it will. You can be impressed with the Bible, and you should be. I think we're all impressed with Scripture. We should be impressed with the Word of God. You can be enamored with the deepest theology, but if you stop short of trusting God and going through theology and Scripture to get to God, then you're not exercising true faith. So beware, precious saints. Beware. Faith can reside in the most familiar places. I mean, unbelief, rather, can reside in the most familiar places. And unbelief can be impressed with good theology. So beware that a love of Bible teaching does not equate to love of God. If you love God, you will certainly love His Word. But beware, because there's a way you can be impressed with Scripture yet still not love the God behind Scripture. So let me ask you, do you love to hear the Word of God expounded because it causes you to love God more and live more earnestly for Him? Or is Scripture just a curiosity to you? Is theology just another hobby for you? This is a way for you to sort of fill up the bookshelves of your mind with content. Beware. Unbelief has the capacity to thrive even though it sits under sound preaching for decades. So examine yourselves and be on guard. Third, unbelief is astounding because it rests on human understanding. I mean, think about Isaiah 40, it's a passage I pray. It, it exalts God's wisdom above man's in every way. God is sent enthroned above the circle of the earth. The inhabitants of the earth are like grasshoppers. I think it's hard to make a stronger contrast between the God of wisdom and might and power and a grasshopper on your you know, rose petal or whatever. Now, that's a massive contrast. But the striking, amazing thing about unbelief is that unbelief rests on its own understanding over and against the infinite understanding, comprehensive knowledge of God. I remember when I was in college, I, I had one of my best friends, grew up in the church, he had a brother who was an unbeliever. And I remember we were on the lake and we were going spearfishing, which was really fun to do. And we were out there on the, on the lake, in the boat, and I knew that this guy was an unbeliever, and I was just waiting for my shot. You know, I was waiting for my shot to get in there. And I asked him, I said, hey, so I hear, I hear that you've you know, sort of walked away from your, your faith. Tell me about that. He said, well, you know, I, I'm in college now, and I, I know that, and I'm learning that there's all this stuff we don't know about the world. It, it's massive, you know, the universe is expansive, and there's just so much we don't know. We don't know even, you know, we know more about outer space even than we know about what's in the depths of the ocean. You know, I just realized there's just so much we don't know. So, you know, I just don't want to, I just don't think we were right about there not being a God. And I heard him out and, I, you know, I sort of tilted my head and I said, so you're telling me that the more you learn that humanity doesn't know, 
the more you're willing to trust them? Uh, that's, that's your logic. And that's the logic of unbelief. I mean, it looks at the vastness of what we don't know about the planet, about ourselves even. And it says, yeah, I'm going to throw my lot in with the grasshoppers. It, it makes no sense. And, and this is what we see in verse 3. And we sort of get to see the logic of unbelief as these folks think out loud. And they go on. They say, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. This is basically their rationale for rejecting Jesus. This is them thinking out loud. They've seen Jesus teach. They've seen his miracles. They've seen his wisdom and they're amazed. But then they fall back on their own logical explanation. They fall back on their own understanding. The, the logical answer to what they've just witnessed is that Jesus is the prophet, the Messiah, the king sent to save the world. But that's not where these people end up. They follow a different logic altogether and lean on their own understanding. And let me try to, to show you what that logic and reasoning looks like here, okay? In the first century, one's identity and social status were virtually fixed at birth. There was no American dream. You didn't work your way up through social status, uh, through different social classes. People with noble roots were the nobility. They were the kings. People without that were lesser servants. You didn't transition from one caste class to the next. And so actually, the way they would have seen this was uh, wrongly so, but part of the way you submit to God is just staying in where your class where you were. This is part of their theology, wrong theology. And so for Jesus to come along and claim that he is God's Messiah, the King, the agent of salvation, Savior of the world, uh, this was more than they could handle. It went against their socially accepted norms of society. You don't do that. You don't transition class from class. And so while they're impressed with Jesus, they quickly get back in the groove of their unbelieving logic and rationalize the situation. And this is what they're doing, basically. All right? They're saying this. We're impressed with what you're saying, but... You're no different than us. You're, you're, you're just like us. You're just an average guy from Nazareth. You can't be the Messiah. Look again at verse 3. Is not this the carpenter? Literally, the words refer to someone who constructs or produces things, sometimes out of wood, sometimes out of stone. We, of course, we call that a carpenter. This was a respectable profession. In Judaism, so this was not a slight at Jesus. They're not saying, oh, you're just a carpenter. That's not what they're saying. This was respectable. I mean, everyone needed a carpenter. as much as you need a carpenter, right? You need a guy. Uh, and they needed a guy. And it was a respectable profession. And they're all only saying not that, oh, he's, you know, in a demeaning way, he's just a carpenter. They're saying, look, he, he's just like us. I mean, he's, he's one of us. We all know him. He's the carpenter. He's not that. He's not the Messiah. He's, he's the carpenter. And they keep on going. He, they say he's the son of Mary, which, of course, was not the usual way to refer to someone. Typically, you would reference their father. But in this case, most likely, because Joseph has been dead for so long, everyone knows Jesus not by Joseph's name, but by Mary. This is Mary's boy. We all know him. And they know his brothers, too. James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And we know, as did they, that Jesus' brothers were not thrilled about the claims he was making. Remember? All right, we see that in John 7 and 5, but we also saw that in Mark 3, 21. Their estimation of Jesus is that he's out of his senses. Uh, he's basically lost his mind. 
And so they say, look, we know you, we, you're, the, you're the carpenter, we know, we know Mary, and we know James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and plus, your sisters are right here with us. Like, we know you. And they're not actually saying, look, your brothers and sisters don't even believe you, why would we believe you? That's not, that's not what they're saying. The point they're making, again, is from their own understanding of how kings and nobility emerge, they don't come from Nazareth or anywhere else. Kings beget kings. Nobility begets nobility. And from their perspective, Jesus is simply not nobility. He's a carpenter. He's Mary's son. He's the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, etc. So they're basically saying, look, you're, you're saying all these wonderful things. We hear you. We're impressed. But look, we're all from Nazareth here. We saw you grow up. We know, knew your dad. We know your mom. We know your family. We know you. We know that you're no messianic king. You're, you're a carpenter. You're a Nazarene just like us. And what strikes me here is that fundamentally they're leaning on what? On their own understanding. On their own logic of how things work. And because they lean on their own understanding, they reject God and are scandalized by Jesus. That's the word. Scandalizo. It's to be scandalized, to be a stumbling block. And they looked at Jesus and were scandalized because they followed their own logic. But if they would have only looked to God's ways and said, what does God say about this? Not what does my social structure say. What does God say? Well, if they would have done that, they would have understood that The Messiah, the promise of the Messiah, when he appeared, he would appear much less like a king immediately and much more like a what? A servant. Isaiah 53, you know that passage. Isaiah 53, 2 promises that the Messiah would grow up like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. Interesting expression, tender shoot like a root out of parched ground. The idea is that you don't expect a tender shoot from a plant to emerge out of dry ground. I mean, just think about your front yard right now. You're not going to come home and expect a tender shoot, you know, in your front yard, unless you're watering, which just costs you a lot of money. But you're not going to expect that. You, You don't expect a tender shoot to emerge out of dry ground. This is speaking to the origins of the Messiah. The idea is that when he comes, he's going to come out of conditions and out of obscurity to an extent and in a way that no one would really expect. Following their own logic, following their own rationale, their own understanding. So what they needed was the eye of faith informed by the word of God in order to see and recognize Jesus for who He is. They needed to throw off their own understanding and adopt God's evaluation and God's estimation and prediction of who His Messiah would be. They were looking for their Messiah made in their own image. They were trusting their own understanding and their own logic. Fundamentally, this is what unbelief does. Just think about it. When you're not believing God, what are you trusting in? You're trusting in yourself. You're trusting in your own understanding. Unbelief always exalts human reasoning and rationale above God. Unbelief always exalts human reasoning and rationale above God and puts itself in God's place as the sole determiner of truth. That's what unbelief does. It says, God, I know you said that, but. God, I know you said you would never leave me nor forsake me, but. By my own estimation, I feel very lonely right now. Unbelief exalts itself over and against God. It views human reasoning as the end all and be all. And really, in, a, in a, a real sense, this is what is wrong with the world at large. Right, look outside, look online, 
and you can see a people who are leaning on their own understanding. They're making sense of the world based upon their own logic. And it's set itself above God as the final judge of truth. And their decision is to say, well, truth doesn't even really matter. What is truth? And given the expansiveness of man's limitations, and given how finite man truly is, it's utterly shocking and amazing that mankind would go toe-to-toe with God like this. And it's astounding. I mean, no wonder Jesus is left in a state of marvel and amazement. Here are these grasshoppers that have exalted themselves above the living God. And they think they're wise. Little man sets himself against the inexhaustible, sovereign, all-wise God. And he leads himself on, and he thinks he knows better than God. You see how astounding that is. But friend, you know it's in your own heart, don't you? I mean, how often do you lean on your own understanding and not upon the wisdom of God? So let me ask you, where are you this morning? Are you here today leaning on your own understanding? Have you exalted yourself and your own reasoning above God, or are you underneath the Word of God? Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying be mindless. I'm not saying throw out your thinking. Scripture again and again calls us to renew our minds and to use our minds to God's glory. But if we're going to renew our minds, that means we have to subjugate our minds to what? The Word of God. And that's really the issue. It's an issue of who's going to win today. Will my reasoning win or will I bring it underneath the Word of God? And over and over again, we have to do that. I mean, you have to do that hour by hour, minute by minute of your life, over and over again, bringing your reason under the, the authority of the Word of God. So the question is, whose wisdom will you follow, God's or your own? I mean, for me, just this week, uh, it was one of those weeks where you think, God, you are wise and sovereign. Isaiah 40 is true. But man, I feel like I'm working backwards in like four different areas. And like, I mean, I, I'm trying to get things done. I feel like I'm having to go back and redo this thing and that thing. And, you know, you think you're making no progress. You think you're working backwards. And you just, you think, God, I trust your wisdom. Couldn't you make this a little smoother? Right? And couldn't this just be a little smoother this week? But think about what am I doing there? What am I doing? I'm exalting my vision for my life above God's. Has God not decreed every interruption of my life and yours? Has He not? When you kick against Him, what you are doing is you're saying, I don't like your vision for my life. I've got a better idea. You want to learn from me? And that is astounding because of your finitude and his magnitude. Right? Well, we could go on, but we need to move on. So far, we've seen that unbelief is a marvel because it's found in unexpected places. It's able to appreciate sound teaching. And amazingly, amazingly, it prefers its own understanding above the wisdom of of God. But let me give you a fourth reason here. Unbelief is amazing because it repeats ancient errors. Now, that's a little stuffy. I get that. Um, so let me put it a different way. Unbelief is amazing because it fails to learn from the past. That's what I mean by that. It fails to learn from the past. Look at verse 4. Notice how Jesus responds to their unbelief and to their reasoning. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. This is a common proverb uh, throughout uh, Judaism. And actually, it sort of goes beyond that. The philosophers had a way of saying it too. 
They would say, until now, my own country alone ignores me, is what one Greek philosopher said. Another said, philosophers always find life to be difficult in their homeland. As these are ancient philosophers, this was ancient wisdom in Judaism. So Jesus is just pulling from a very common proverb to say what we would say uh, with our own proverb. Familiarity breeds contempt. That's all this is saying here. Familiarity breeds contempt. And and the proverb kind of starts out wide. It starts with one's hometown, and then it narrows down to one's extended family, his own relatives, maybe cousins, aunts, uncles. And then it narrows down to the immediate household, brothers, sisters, moms, and dad. And of course, the, the point of the proverb is that familiarity breeds content. A prophet then may be appreciated everywhere he goes, but he can be sure that in his own hometown he will receive disdain and dishonor. There's just something about fallen nature where familiarity with something often produces distrust or suspicion. And no matter how many times the sages of the past... Judas, Judas, Jews, Jewish prophets, rather, uh, Greek philosophers, they're all saying the same thing because it's a human phenomenon. Familiarity breeds contempt. No matter how many times people tell us this, it's something that happens again and again. And we see this in the nation of Israel on repeat. Right? We, you think about the Old Testament. God sends them a prophet, and they welcome him and love him and celebrate him and lavish him with rewards and blessings. No. Over and over again, God sends a prophet from Moses to John the Baptist. And the people of Israel despise, rebel, and even kill the prophets. Zechariah was stoned to death. Jeremiah was threatened with death, imprisoned, thrown into a well, and then deported to Egypt. Now, what do prophets do? Literally, they are the mouthpiece of God. This is God coming to you, speaking to you. Unbelief takes the megaphone and stomps it on the ground. I don't want to hear from God. Isaiah, they sawn him, they, he was sawn in half. The grammar on that's a little tricky. He was sawn in half. Amos was hunted down, Micaiah was punched in the face, and then imprisoned by religious leaders. And you could go on and on, but the theme of persecution of the prophets, of this proverb that a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, permeates the entire Old Testament, even comes into the New Testament with the culmination of the prophet like unto Moses who was treated with such contempt, Jesus, crucified. Stephen, the first martyr of the church in the book of Acts, summarizes this well. He says this as he's being stoned. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. And notice this. You are doing just what your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Unbelief never learns its lesson. It commits the same error over and over and over again. It fails to look to the past and say, our fathers killed the prophets, we better stop. But it fails to look to the past and see what God was doing and repent. That's what I mean by unbelief fails to learn from the past. Now, principally, uh, we can see the same in our own lives. Now, we don't kill the prophets. At least none of you have tried to kill me yet. Um, I've only been preaching for 49 minutes now, so hold your weapons. Uh, We'll try to wrap this up. We don't kill the prophets, but principally, we do the same thing. We fail to look to the past and learn from it, don't we? 
We fail to remember God's goodness to us, His faithfulness, His provision. And because we fail to do that, we commit the same ancient proverbial error. We dishonor the Lord with our unbelief. We dishonor the Lord with our unbelief. Why did they kill the prophets? Because they did not believe these were ones sent from God. Unbelief fails to look to the past and learn the lessons that God would have it to learn. So let me ask you, when was the last time, Christian, that you looked at your past and observed the goodness of God? When was the last time you reflected on God's providence? When was the last time you counted your blessing? Blessings. You have more than one. When was the last time you reminded yourself that you have no reason ever to question or to doubt the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And I'll tell you, the way to fight unbelief in your heart is to look back at God's past faithfulness and see how foolish it is for you not to trust Him in the present. It's utterly foolish. Why would we not trust Him? You have no reason to doubt Him. So we've seen that unbelief resides in the most unexpected places. It recognizes sound teaching, but it still responds in unbelief. It rests on human understanding. It fails to learn from the past. And then one more, maybe most shocking of all, number five. Unbelief is astounding because it restricts the positive blessing of God. Look at verse five. It's an amazing verse. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. In verse 6, he wondered at their unbelief. That's a shocking statement. He could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people. The unbelief present in Nazareth somehow limited and restricted the ministry of Jesus and robbed these people of seeing and experiencing the blessing of God. Now the question, of course, is this. In what way did their unbelief limit Jesus' ability to do miracles? That's the big question. That's why it sort of makes you uncomfortable when you read that. How can we limit God? Is the power of Jesus somehow bound up with the faith of mankind and, and our faith sort of you know, mixes with it and activate, activates it and makes it effective? Is God limited until we exercise faith? Well, no. I mean, read Isaiah 40. Right? Is God limited? No. He is the infinite and boundless God. There is no limit to Him. He's not limited or restricted by us in any essential way. I, I mean, I think of I, uh, Psalm 115.3. Our God is in the heavens and He does whatsoever He pleases. If God wanted to heal everyone there, He could have done it. And we see Him heal people in the Gospels without them exercising faith. I mean, think about the lepers. right? One of them doesn't even return or obey. The ten lepers. So then, in what way does unbelief restrict the power the bless, or the power here of our Lord? Well, it does so in this sense. Right, here's what I think this means. Unbelief restricts the blessing of God in the sense that Jesus must necessarily withhold His grace from these people lest He affirm them in their state of unbelief. Unbelief restricts the blessing of God in the sense that Jesus must necessarily withhold His blessing, His grace, from the people of Nazareth, lest He affirm them in their state of unbelief. It's not that He's actually or essentially restricted by unbelief. It's that in light of their unbelief, He cannot bless them lest He affirm them in their faithlessness. Do you see that? He chooses not to do this lest he confirm them in their state of unbelief. And the irony, though, which I think uh, confirms the argument here, 
is that the text says he could do no miracle, and notice this, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Now, that's a miracle to me, isn't it? But the emphasis here that is, you know, it's in light of the magnitude of miracles that Jesus had been doing in and around Galilee, comparatively speaking, what he did in Nazareth was nothing compared to what he could have done and would have joyfully done if the people would have met his presence with faith. But their unbelief prompts his judgment rather than his blessing. And that's axiomatic of unbelief. God does not reward unbelief with blessing. How could he? He doesn't reward unbelief with grace and help. When you think about James, you want your prayers heard, you have to ask in a very specific way. Right? Without wavering or doubting. God, because of His wisdom, His grace, He does not reward unbelief lest He reinforce it. And so, He withholds the blessing of maybe 500 plus people being healed in Nazareth at His presence because of unbelief. If He blessed unbelief, it would suggest that He's not concerned about it. It would do the opposite of what Mark and Jesus are trying to do in this passage to show us that unbelief is astounding to him. If he blessed it, what is he saying? No, it's not that big of a deal. It's okay. We'll just sweep it under the rug. No, unbelief is astounding to him and it's offensive. And so God meets the unbelief in Nazareth by withholding the blessing of Christ's ministry to them. That's amazing. And he meets our unbelief, Christian, with loving discipline and not his positive blessing. Now, of course, for the Christian, the discipline of God is a blessing, right? It's a blessing, but I'm saying it's a negative blessing because none of us like the way the discipline feels. It's like you children. You don't like being disciplined. We don't like it either. We have to discipline you, but God disciplines us. And Hebrews 12 says, discipline is sorrowful and painful. It's hard. And the Lord looks at our unbelief, and He meets it with loving discipline so that we will learn to believe Him and obey Him. And notice this. This is Hebrews 12. If anyone does not receive this kind of chastisement from the Lord, God says that that person does not belong to him. Hebrews 12, 5 and 8. He disciplines those whom he loves. He he will not reward your unbelief with blessing. Positive. He will reward it with a rod of discipline. So that you will learn to obey, to believe Him. And so that afterwards, your having been disciplined will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Discipline hurts, but it's necessary for us. When we believe God, we get His positive blessing. When we live in unbelief, we get His loving discipline. So then faith is what puts us in the place of positive blessing. Unbelief puts us in the place of discipline and chastisement. Now, which place do you want to be in, my friend? (laughs) Why would you willingly say, yeah, bring me the rod? No one would say that. Why would you say, yeah, I want to be in this sphere over here where I'm getting the rod of God on my back for my disobedience? It's loving, it's tender, it's gracious, it's perfectly measured, it's not harsh, it's not abuse. It's exactly as it should be. But it leads to sorrow and pain, Hebrews 12. When he says, 
the paths of obedience are the path of blessing and joy and life everlasting. The marvel of unbelief, especially in a Christian, is that we would choose to live unbelieving when God offers us us life and peace and joy by simple faith. It's amazing. Well, I could go on and on. I think you believe that. Um, But I, I, I hope you get the point. Unbelief is staggering, and it's a marvel to our Lord. And here, Jesus encounters raw unbelief, and it leaves him astounded, amazed, and no doubt brokenhearted. And remember his impulse we saw last few weeks. His impulse is to relieve the misery of broken, fallen people. And here he comes to them to relieve them of their misery, and they say, no, we don't want that. Shocking. His own people reject him. And this may be the most staggering moment of unbelief in history. I don't know. It's marked in Scripture as the thing that astounds him. But I hope you see. One of the things I didn't want to happen as we studied this passage was for us to sort of sit in judgment on those unbelieving Nazarenes. How dare they treat our Lord that way? We've got enough unbelief in our own hearts, I think, to render heaven astounded as well. And so I I want us all to to look at the danger of unbelief residing in our own hearts and give ourselves to go to war with it. Because it will cripple you. It will cripple you. It will make you hobble around trusting in your own wisdom. And friend, that's no way to live. Jettison that. Trust God and have life eternal and blissful That begins even now. All right? May the Lord help us do so. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this reminder of the staggering nature of unbelief. Would you help us to abandon our own understanding and bring our rationale, our reasoning under your word and to obey you and simply cling to the promises of your word. Help us, Lord, to run to you over and over again, to turn from unbelief, root it out in our own heart, and follow Christ. And also, Lord, we do ask, if there are any here this morning who have lived in a perpetual state of leaning on their own understanding, we pray that you would call them to flee to Christ this morning and find in Him a merciful, gracious Savior, ready to welcome the vilest offenders who truly believe. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.